Okay. Uh, 2019, 
Uh, and actually, it's fun. We have a couple of people. We have we have our second girl, Kathleen, and we have Mary, Mary in the audience. And, um, anyway, I just want to say with, with that, uh, uh, it's a good play. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I did that. You know, I started my first directing job with O'Neill was all got still got wings, so it had to you know I had to I'll go like that. But um, but anyway, uh, it's a really good play. What I what I really want to do when I was at Dow House, or gosh, I was at Dow House, and I really wanted to connect uh, the sense of young Edmund as a writer and Eugene O'Neill as the writer there on site, just a couple hundred feet away, writing this play that we were hearing that night. Because I, for some of you, most of you know, but. Um, we perform in the barn, which is just a couple hundred feet away from the study where he writes, where he wrote. Um, and uh, so, you know, among other things, uh, I tried to get very meta about it. I had, I had uh, Edmund in Act 4 when he's sharing and recounting his experiences at sea. I had him go to his journals if these were the entries he had written. So that 1912 fictional Edmund was saying things that 1940 real Eugene would write for 19 fictional, 1912 fictional Edmund. Um, and that was kind of where I went with it, but I, it's a very good play. Uh, Moon from Miss Begotten, uh, I'm just another one of the C plays. Uh, I'm looking forward to directing it. A couple of things about that, just to uh, share. Um, I, I'm having the actor Ryan Hayes come back. Three years ago, he played Jamie. So now he's coming back three years later as Jim. And um, it's only three years, it's supposed to be a 10 year span, but he's been living for three years during the pandemic in New Orleans, drinking like a fish. So he's going to get as dissipated as he can in three years of time, he's told me. Uh, so also, also uh, I have, uh, in, in Moon, um, I have, Caitlin is going to be joining us in that cast, uh, going for the Hellion over the Amazon, in my take, for why uh, Josie is so, uh, such a misfit uh, in that production. Um, the Iceman Cometh, uh, directed that in 2014. Uh, that's a Great play, also. Uh, I just, I've always, I love the ending. I mean, for, for all of you, you know, just the, the idea of, uh, of of Hickey's revelation that he's mad, and so that's why he killed his wife, and then Harry Hope leading everyone else into the idea that, well, if he's mad, then nothing he said counts. So now we're all cheering and happy and singing, and I just love the counterpoint O'Neill created with Larry, the one person who didn't, you know, didn't bite, who didn't, who is now stuck. In this swirl of activity, he can't relate to it, and uh, I find that great, uh, delicious. Um, and then now I have uh, my last in this category of C plays is *All Wilderness*. Um, obviously, it gets produced. Uh, it's a charming play. Uh, directed it about ten years ago. Um, my big question about that play is why. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, understand, I understand the idea of like it's great when you. You think of the path not taken, and O'Neill recreating a fictional version of his childhood, and you know that sort of thing. But it's neither fish nor fowl. If you want something fun, you want something else. If you want something else, O'Neill, you know, watch something else. I don't know why you would choose uh, wilderness if you want either of those things, or O'Neill, or something funny. Um, <laughs> but people like, you know, we all get a lot of mileage out of his only comedy, you know, that that thing. Um, so now we finally come to. The naval planes. And by naval, I don't mean ships and boats. I mean some kind of self therapy you stare at as naval as you think about these plays. Um, the, the first one I start with is uh, The First Man. Uh, you may recall that's the, the anthropologist and his wife, Martha, and uh, she wants a baby and that's going to ruin everything. And it's just, it's just so clearly O'Neill, you know, wanting to have things his way and not wanting to have to deal with poopy diapers and all kinds of stuff. So, um, so anyway, uh, and now, oh, now, we have our first demonstration, Love and Magnets. Oh, I start this. <laughs> the following lines are from the play Welded. Oh, it was beautiful madness. I lost myself. I began living in you. I wanted to die and become you. And I. You. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know why the women in your place are so wooden. You ought to thank me for breathing life into them. Good God! How dare you criticize creative work, you actress? <laughs> <laughs> 
I'd give anything in the world to live those days over again. Our love was a revelation, then a miracle to the sky. Our marriage must be a consummation, demanding and combining the best in each of us. Hard, difficult, guarded from the commonplace, kept sacred as the outward form of our inner harmony. <laughs> we'll tend the flame on an altar. Not in a kitchen range. <laughs> Home, 
Uh, I know I directed all those together. They tend to be put together. They're a nice program together. They have a lot of the same Glen Karen characters, recurring characters. Um, I, I, I like all of those plays. I think they're really infinitely doable. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess say go for it, do it. Um, then there's Idol. I've never, I've never uh, directed it, um, but I enjoy the madness part of it. You know, the wife has her type of madness, the husband has his type of gay happy madness. Um, so I, 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 I do that one if I, I, I had a chance. Uh, so now we have new demonstration. Two worlds of honor. <clears throat> Many of you may know or probably recall the first lines Anna speaks in Anna Christie. Give me a whiskey. Ginger ale on the side, and don't be stingy, baby. <laughs> Shall I serve it in a pail? <laughs> <laughs> well, that sends me down to the ground. But how many of you remember the first lines Anna speaks in Chris Christopherson? <laughs> father! A father! Anna! It's so good to see you, Father, at the house after all these years. You like some tea? <laughs> I make right of it. Good tea. Uh, if, if you haven't seen it, you want to. Um, all right, uh, thirst. 
<laughs> I was taking a victory lap, I remember. <laughs> okay, all right, thirst. Um, I, I, it's, I don't think of, it's not a particularly good play. It always sounds like a, a joke. You know, like a, like a gentleman, a dancer, <laughs> and a long sailor walk into a bar, you know, or found in a boat, you know. Um, if I did it, I would do it in Gino Neal's pool at Dow House. I would put that boat a rubber raft there. I'd have another actor be a shark, you know, with a fin to go back and forth in the pool. I think it's, it calls for spectacle. It needs to be spectacle. Because, uh, yeah, I think that's the way that play would work. Um, on an exciting note, actually. Um, for the very first time, I actually filmed something in the pool uh, at Dow House. Uh, I've made these ghost videos that some of you have seen. Um, I have Eugene, actually, John plays Eugene. Eugene uh, channeling Edmund about you know how he wishes he was a seagull or a fish while he's swimming in the pool. So it's, it's kind of cool. It'll, it'll come out in, you know after this conference. Um, okay, then there's where the cross is made. Uh, I like the madness part of it. Uh, you know the sort of uh, you know serial the ghosts coming to visit out of guilt or greed or whatever it is that summoned. I've always thought it was interesting, and some of you might know this, but um, you know, uh, where the cross is made actually. Uh, Art Carney in the early 60s did, uh, devoted an entire episode of his show to a screen adaptation of where the, where, the, where the Cross is made. And so for me, that always is the badge of, wow, O'Neill was in vogue if the Art Carney show in prime time was doing a, an obscure old one-act play for his show that week. I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have the play Gold, which, as you know, is where the Cross is made, and then he kind of did the prequel thing and, and shoved it together. Um, I don't think it works as well. Because what you learn in the first act is how horrible those people were to other people on the island. So then you're not sympathetic to them in the second half. You know, when you, when you see them and they're mad and they're guilty, but now you know, I just don't care about them because they were just so horrible uh, to the people. Um, then the Moon for the Caribbees, um, interesting, interesting play. I, I mean, I think it has, uh, it has uh, some casting challenges and some language challenges. And um, I, I do, uh, on one hand, I do think it's... Uh, it's interesting that it, it, to do it would be, uh, you know, you'd want to create this ambiance. It's all about, you know, about a place and a mood and an and, and experience, not so much a plot. Um, there's plot, but not a lot of plot. Um, and, and I think actually in some ways that's very, uh, very uh, topical. I mean, the idea of, I think theater, the direction theater needs to go, or a lot of people, are, is, it needs to be more of a happening, it needs to be more an event. And, and immersion is one of those ways you get that for it. You know, get people excited about being immersed in something. So at least I think that play offers an immersion opportunity. Um, and I do, it does have a great, uh, you know, near the end of the play, the stage direction. Uh, silence broken by the haunted, saddened voice of the brooding music, faint and far off, like the mood of the moonlight made audible. <laughs> I always think that's just cool. I like, I like that description. Okay. Uh, oh, I got um, just a little director's note for you. Uh, empty, I call it the empty stage. It's just something um, that I, I recognize with O'Neill is, um, I don't know how many times in his plays, at the end of the scene, he has the characters leave the scene. And so you get to see the curtain come down or the lights go out on furniture. <laughs> so whenever I can, I leave that actor on stage. Give me something. Give me what you're feeling. Give me some you know, anxiety or your hope or whatever it is. Sell your beyond and let the lights come down on that. Um, and I, yeah, I just think it's dramatically more effective than watch. I mean, obviously, if it's something like, uh, uh, oh, Robert Mayo's just climbed out the window, we gotta go. They run, and it, obviously. But if, if, if you could put them and keep them on stage and let the lights just do that on them, it's much more interesting. Um, okay, and that uh, brings us to a new category place. These are actually some of my favorites. Um, they, I call them bang for your buck plays, okay? <laughs> They're mostly one act plays, a lot of you know them. As, as part of the collection known as the Lost Plays. Um, you know, you have abortion. I, I, I love uh, the uh, Jack Townsend, you know, sports college hero. Uh, the, the ending is just beautifully, uh, and where's Steve? Not the very ending. Okay, <laughs> we have a discussion about that. Um, but, uh, but anyway, um, the, the, the setup for the ending, the idea of this guy who's getting this crushing news about how this woman he's impregnated is, is dying because of the complications of abortion, and they're cheering for him outside, and they just think that's delicious tension to have, you know, have him feeling wrapped with guilt and hearing people cheer his name. Uh, I think that's a, that's a great uh, dramatic setup. Uh, you have the play Warnings, 
Um, I, 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 I feel like my in into warnings is, is the notion of, um, and just a quick, it's, it's kind of a two scene play as I recall. And the first scene is kind of the setup scene where uh, James Knapp is at home, it's domestic, his wife's telling him how much they don't have money, he's got a gaggle of kids running around with bad traps are over, and they're all those kids <laughs> everywhere, it was a Lisa like thing. Um, and, and, uh, and it's just like, and so then the second, so you know he needs the, needs the job, he needs the money, so then he goes off, he's, you know, he's the wireless operator who can't, he's having trouble hearing, and because he has trouble hearing, you know, in the second scene, there's, there's a horrible accident, and he's the cause of it, um, you know, and he, and he, and he, uh, he feels very guilty about it. Um, but anyway, I know that, that doesn't, generally, the first scene doesn't work well because the characters like the wife come off so two-dimensional. I feel like the one way that you could do that is because it's about his, his trouble hearing, if you kind of channel the first scene as if it's through him, it's through his experience, it's through his isolation he's feeling because he already has trouble hearing, I think it could excuse the two-dimensionality of the other characters if they're being filtered through his experience. And so that would be the angle at this point that I would take to try to make that play work. Um, you have the play Bread and Butter. Um, you know, that's a, that's a little bit like Now I Ask You. Uh, I, I um, kind of like it at first, and then it kind of goes for me, uh, because at, at some point I'm just like, why are these people staying in this room? <laughs> Where is the gun, the gun when they need it? You know? um, so uh, then Recklessness, uh, uh, Light Recklessness, did, uh, did a short uh, recording during the pandemic of Recklessness. Um, I was, it, it was interesting to think of Recklessness as a Dowhouse play, in the sense that it's supposed to be the rich guy on the hill with the windy road, and it was it kind of fit down house in, in a lot of ways. Um, I liked it. And if I did it again, I would change the chauffeur Fred to chauffeur Freeman. You know, <laughs> just, just to throw that in there. Uh, so, um, and then we'll get a little note, just a little note. Uh, it, uh, director's note, uh, physical abuse. Um, excuse me, I know it's my hair. Um, I, I really go out of my way to take physical domestic abuse out of O'Neill's plays. Once that man, the husband, chokes his wife, the argument for the other audience is over. Yeah, you're the good guy, you're, you're the guy, bad guy, you know? It's, it's that clear. So, and I want, if I want to maintain the tension between the arguments, whatever it is, I just avoid that. And I know I think, uh, I think the husband in recklessness chokes um, Mildred, the wife. I, you know, I, um, I know, I know, oh, the, uh, the, the slap or something of Sarah by Con Melody, late in poet. I think throws things off in a certain way. Um, oh, and Weldon, I think Weldon has it too, right? I think Weldon has this Michael choking Eleanor. I just, I take that out. I, it's not that I, I don't take them, I don't de escalate the fight. If anything, I build the fight even more. I just don't do that because then it's like, no, now we don't care about what the characters or what they have to say. You know? And it's, I guess it you know, kind of reflects a different sensibility that that was a little more okay, uh, you know, uh, a long time ago. Uh, then you have the web. Uh, we did a version of it uh, during the pandemic. Um, I like that play a lot. I think it's interesting that it has so many social issues in it, including at the end of the play, uh, police bias. They just charge into a room, see a body, see a, a, a you know add a you know a, 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 a you know a, a TV you know uh, prostitute with child, and just go, you're the bad one. Come with us, you know. And it's just like it was like there was no there was no. Questioning of like, well, did you do this? I mean, she says she didn't, but of course she did. You know, and I think that's just interesting that it has that inherent bias in it. Um, then there's before breakfast. I've never directed that one. Um, I'm always interested in the other room. Like, I just want to have a room. Now, like, like, like what do you think? It's a sharp place, and maybe you could do the, the traditional way and see Mrs. Rowland and the way, and then and then do and then do the same scene, same scene, but now have it in his room and see him. While we listen to Mrs. Rowland in the other room, I don't know, or maybe do a split screen where you could jump back and forth. But I just want to know what a little bit more about what that other half, other part of the equation is, the, the thing we don't see uh, in that scene. Um, personal equation. Uh, oh yeah, this is I, a woman uh, a few years ago came up to me. I was in a retirement community, and she was a Russian woman, and she just wanted to let me know how much they studied and admired Eugene O'Neill in school when she was growing up in the Soviet Union. And this seems to be one of those plays. You know, all those plays that make you think the socialists and the revolution, and you know, and they, they must have really locked on to any of those plays with those themes, and, and in Russia and, and Soviet Union. Um, it, yeah, it's uh, interesting. And then there's exorcism, um, which is, you know, the, aut the uh, autobiographical, uh, you know, overdose of O'Neill uh, play. Um, I, I've never uh, directed it, but I was in 
2012, which I think when it was first published, uh, you know, um, I was in some reading and I just was one of those guys at the end who's saying, oh, you beautiful doll, you great big beautiful doll, or something at the end. Um, but anyway, okay, so this brings us to a demonstration on my favorite. Thanks for your buck plays, or how to make sure the audience knows the play has ended. <laughs> uh, recklessness. Mildred's lover, chauffeur Fred, is dead. <laughs> she goes upstairs. Sound of gunshot. End of play. <laughs> Bread and butter. After a fight with his wife, John Brown says, By God, there is an end to everything. He runs upstairs. Sound of gunshot. End of play. <laughs> Abortion. Jack Townsend is overwhelmed with guilt and shame and hears the adoring crowd outside his window cheering for him. He's a jolly good fellow. He's a jolly good fellow. Jack grabs a gun. Sound of gunshot. <laughs> Not end of play. His fans, fiance comes in and sees Jack. <laughs> end of play. <laughs> Warnings. Wireless operator James Knapp says, God, it's my fault. It's my fault. She is lost. She is lost. No stairs. No stairs. <laughs> Sound of gunshot. End of play. <laughs> the personal equation. Second engineer Thomas Perkins holds off a crowd of revolutionaries led by his own son, Tom. Sound of gunshot. But Tom does not die. Continues to talk about the cause. Long live the revolution. Long live the revolution. End of play. <laughs> Before breakfast, Mrs. Rowland says, Serves you right. I won't stand for your loafing any longer. Alfred! Alfred! Why don't you answer me? Yeah, no gunshot. Bloody hand appears. <laughs> Mrs. Rowland walks in the bathroom. <laughs> End of play. <laughs> Exorcism. Thinly veiled fictional O'Neill figure goes upstairs. That, no gunshot. <laughs> no rope, no rope. Okay. Takes an overdose of Veridol, sleeping drug. <laughs> Not in the play, roommate James, James Biff saves him. <laughs> a year later, James Biff jumps to his death. <laughs> End of play. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
And all of a sudden now I'm like, oh, I think that's interesting. Maybe I can make that play work. In some ways, welded is in that category for me. Applying some things I was thinking about in another place helped me in that play. I've always been a sucker for shadows. So, you know, put, put shadows in a play. It's good, you know? Um, but anyway, that's something I do. Um, next, I'll come to uh, my favorite category of plays. Uh, I call them the Twilight Zone plays. They are the ones that are written to be expressionistic. Uh, favorites of them are Emperor Jones and Harry A. Um, uh, I think it's interesting that they both uh, present the same problem. They're both eight same plays. They both kind of have this trajectory. For Brutus Jones, it's a descent into madness. For, for Ye, it's a descent into alienation. Um, you want to be theatrically you know, letting that descent happen. And you run into an issue with scene seven on a scene eight in both cases. Like Ye, for instance. For, for when I did the production many years ago, I, you know, I, I went from a progression of scene four, uh, and now here's everyone talking in unison. Okay, so that's what's hit, that's distortion for him. Then in scene five, everyone's a grotesque marionette, as you might remember on Fifth Avenue. Scene six, he's in prison, they're disembodied voices. Scene seven goes back, is as written to, I mean, he's rejected by the union people, but it's written as a straight up regular scene. Before he then goes and finds the other person he can relate to as a gorilla. And I felt that didn't, that, that didn't keep the trajectory. So my, my solution in that case was to uh, impose, uh, at some point, Yank says something about bugs. And I decided, okay, we're going to make all the union people look like insects and give them uh, insect activities. So, so then, again, it just kept being, you know, and of course the cop was a bull. You know, there's a little scene with a bull for the cop. You know, but I just wanted to make sure, because once, the, for me, once the human faces left him, I didn't want them to return, and that's what I needed to fix about that wobbly scene. No more human faces. He doesn't see people anymore. He hears things, people look distorted to him, and finally there's no one but the girl. And so that, you know, and Ember, Ember, uh, I mean, Ember Jones a little bit like that too. You get to, you get this kind of going back, it's first going back into his personal history, then he starts going back into kind of cultural trauma history, you know, like being a scene, you know, scene five I think is on the auction block, scene six he's on the slave ship. You know, scene seven then is this, like, the crocodile god? And I, I really struggle with, like, what are you supposed to do with that scene? Um, you know, what, is the, what does it represent? The crocodile god, like, uh, the primal fear of being eaten? I don't, you know, I don't know. I struggle with that. And what helped me eventually was to think of, okay, keep following the trajectory. So you have, you have him being sold, then you go backwards to being on a ship. So the next moment backwards is the moment he was captured, the moment he lost his freedom. In a sense, he symbolically died. It happens to end right at the same time that he sort of dies. You have the last gunshot go off. So I just wanted to maintain those, you know, that trajectory. Because, and also, I love the theatricality of these plays. Uh, um, I didn't want to diminish them. I think it would be, it would throw things off if, if you all sent through another realistic scene in there. Um, another note, director's note I want to share. I'm at 41 minutes. I'm doing really well, by the way. Uh, I can think I can do this, actually. Um, uh, I, public versus private is my note. And it's something I tell the actors all the time. They have a hard time with the emotional 180s of the characters. Oh, people write emotional 180s. I feel this, know this, know this, know this. And I, and, I, and I think there's this distinction that helps, at least for me, in thinking about which part of it is public and which part is private. You know, which part is me to best, and which part is like saying something to my actors. You know what I mean? And to try to create a public private relationship with one's own dialogue. Um, in some ways, it becomes like the difference between spoken to other people versus internal thought. You know, it's a little bit like, and in my next play, uh, uh, Strange Interview, it's a little bit like that, you know, where it actually, that's actually what, what O'Neill was doing. Um, uh, and the only production I've never directed, it, the only production I saw was the one in, in New Ross two years ago. Um, I wasn't inspired to, after that production, to, to jump on it. Sometimes I see something and I go, oh, okay, I didn't like what they did, but I know what to do, you know, and I didn't, I didn't get any inspiration watching uh, that, that play. Um, so uh, then we have Dynamo, that one I do like. I was excited to hear Herman. I know he talked about Dynamo sometimes. I like Dynamo. I, I, I think uh, I did a stage reading of it once. But 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 what I would uh, what I would want to emphasize is visuals, the auditory, the sense, the, the sensory part of that play. Um, the idea, you know, in the first part of the play, there's the mother, and then later the sort of mother substitute Dynamo, you know, with the whirring sound or whatever the metallic sound. Um, I would try to heighten that. I would maybe even have the mother singing a lullaby or something in the first half, and then be able to replicate some of those sounds in the lullaby in the sound of the dynamo. So we created more ways in which it's like that is mother. Um, so uh, then also Great God Brown. Thanks for going there, Alex. I appreciate you taking out for that. Um, I like that play a lot. Uh, 
Uh, it, it's, um, it's a great play. Um, yeah, I do that. I love to do a full production, this stage reading of it. Um, and I made them do in masks, those two sensor stage, because the year before I did uh, Days Without End, uh, the year before, as a stage reading. Mm -hmm. And my decision at that point was to not put them in masks. I was too afraid that, like, uh, the mask would, you, you could do a stage reading with a mask, you know, like, I can't see this. It would, it would be like the start of Halloween, if you remember the movie Halloween. Kind of a little kid, like, uh, anyway. Um, but anyway, um, uh, it actually serves the play, get rid of the mask, the death mask. I don't know, it's almost like Botox. Why would you take the most interesting character, Loving is the most interesting character in that play, put him, you know, Botox is basically so can't express anything, because he got a death mask on. So it worked so much better. He got, he's the cynical side of the character of John Loving, you know, John and Loving. And, and this, to, to get all the expression, expressiveness of, of the cynical side of Loving uh, was so much better when he had a face to work with. Um, also, uh, if I can get a full production, I don't know, if anyone's producing this, they can talk to me. Um, uh, I would have two actors learn both John and Loving. Because there's supposed to be two halves of a coin. They're supposed to be, you know, the same person. They literally should finish their sentence, each other's sentences. Not, not just like an old married couple, but like they're literally each other. And so I would want those actors to know each other and their role inside out so you have that total fluidity between those two characters and a synergy about the way they act with each other. Because um, it really is just one person. Um, then I come to my last of, of my uh, uh, plays that I'm putting in my Twilight Zone play, uh, I, I, All God's Chillin'. I actually did produ a full production of this in 2008. Um, one of the ways I think of it as an expressionistic play is I love that, and you may recall, the, I think it's scene five, the marriage scene, where it's supposed to happen at an, at an intersection between the black community and the white community. And you not only have the scrutinizing eyes of one community staring at them and the scrutinizing eyes of the other community, but O'Neill actually writes the stage directions about all the windows and the buildings looking at their like, eyes also. And it just, I love that, that he was tightening that sense of you know, being scrutinized, uh, even in the description of the building. Um, it, that put, uh, all that film does bring me to one of the points I want to put up which is um, uh, objectionable language. Uh, that is definitely one of those challenging plays. And this is what I learned doing it, is if O'Neill, like for instance the N-word, if O'Neill's using it in the vernacular, I don't, there's no, I don't need it. It's a distraction. But if you have a play that is about the impression of a black man and you want it to be as dramatic as possible, you gotta use the language that oppressed him. And so when I did it, you know, and actually this came out of a dialogue with the actors, because uh, I originally cast a vener very venerable guy named Aldo Billingsley uh, on the West Coast. He's a very well-known stage actor, worked at Ashland and other places. He was originally looking at the role, then he decided to pass on it, but he recommended another actor named Michael Asbury. And Michael was thinking about taking the role, but he felt uncomfortable about the language. And so he called up Aldo and said, Aldo, what do you think of the language? And Aldo's response was beautiful. I'm so glad he said it. He said, well, Michael, what do you think the character thinks of the language? You know? And the character felt the same way as you feel, fine, that's okay, that works. So anyway, I, 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 that was, my, that was my, one of my, my lessons about trying to deal with language that's, uh, you know, that's uh, disturbing. It doesn't serve the story, or does it doesn't distract from the story, and it's always kind of a, a, weight, a weighing game. Okay, I get to another category of plays. The Cecil B. DeMille plays, these are the ones that call for a cast of a billion people in them. <laughs> okay, the fountain, you know, the fountain. Um, I, I've always, I've always liked your nano takes out. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, character nano. Um, it has. The, I want to read you one of the stage directions. I really like this one. Late in the play, the father superior is a portly monk with a, a simple round face, gray hair, and a beard. His large eyes have the opaque calm of a ruminating cow's. I just like that description. <laughs> I love that description. That's awesome. Uh, that's maybe you know some of the best writing in there. Uh, uh, Marco Millions, uh, again, cast of a billion people. It also has that sort of prologue thing, which is interesting. Um, but then we come to uh, Lazarus Laugh. No, I like Lazarus Laugh. Um, and here's the key, and this is where Dave King and I talk about this sometimes. Lazarus is not the lead character. It, you know, for me, it's like Lazarus, yeah, I agree, he's a symbol. But it's, it's, the title is Lazarus Laugh. It was Lazarus, I'd say, oh yeah, it's his story. It's not his, it's his action that's the story. And the really character is Caligula. And that's the character I find fascinating. 
So it's the, it's the struggle of Caligula that for me makes that story work, and it just happens to be the catalyst of, of Lazarus that makes, you know, makes that happen. Um, okay. Size matters. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm just going to pop on this one. You, you don't need that. <laughs> okay. All right. My, my point with size matters is um, is that when I was working on Morning Becomes Electra, I, I, it was a very early lesson for me. It was one of the first plays I directed. I had actors who their instinct was to be honest by taking it down, taking you know taking the performance down. That was real. That was honest. And with that material, it's big, and you have to fill it. You have to fill it. You have to go there. Otherwise, you're false. Your worst fear comes true if you don't feel what O'Neill wrote for you. Those giant epic passions and feelings, you need to go there. Oh, and by the way, the, the thing about the exclamation points, I, I don't have an exact answer for the number of exclamation points in Morning Becomes Electra, but I have a formula for you. And my formula is, take the, count the number of pages in Library of America, Collected Works of Eugene O'Neill, uh, uh, third volume three, Okay, multiply it by the collective self-loathing of the Manning family, <laughs> and then divide by gun shots. <laughs> and you'll get roughly the number of exclamation points. <laughs> uh, another category, uh, the other Dow House plays, uh, uh, Touch of the Poet and More State of the Mansions. Um, I, 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 I directed a full production of uh, Touch of the Poet, really like that play. So, uh, the key for me is it's, uh, Khan, gets, Khan gets all the publicity pictures. But it's really Sarah and Nora's play. It's the mother-daughter that I find is the heart of that play. Um, and then, and then I did a stage reading a long time ago of, of uh, more stately mansions. Um, and I do think it's really interesting uh, with Xander the experience of kind of reading your book and then having our discussions on the phone about the, how to put them all together. Um, I think the one thing that jumps out, and we talked about this probably, is. Um, one of my favorite scenes, you might guess, because I like theatricality in more stately mansions, is that sort of I call it the Hamlet scene, but it's where Simon is in his head, and then his mother's in his head, and then Sarah's in the head, and then the head, then the thoughts are having a conversation and ganging up on each other. And that's very theatrical, and I wouldn't want to lose that. But if I did, uh, like if we did it as a whole thing, I would want to find uh, stylistically a way to use devices like that at least a few times during the production. You know, I need to find other place where I could apply that. Um, I actually do that in, in Welded. Um, uh, Welded, uh, there's the one time that they do sort of the, the, the aside thing. And, uh, Michael and Eleanor in scene one, I think, do an aside thing. And so I had them return and do an aside thing in scene four, their other scene. And I just feel like it's just like, if you, get, you can't do it just once, it looks weird. I think you've got to do it at least a couple times to establish that it's in the style of the telling of this particular story you're trying to tell. Uh, then you come to Huey. We've got three more plays to go. Uh, uh, you come to Huey. I love Huey. Um, when I did it a few years ago, I really focused on creating the third character because all that writing in the, in the stage directions is brilliant. It's, 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 it's his half man, half fish. It's his hybrid creation of novel and play. And, um, and to mix them, you know, and, and, to, and, and, and the one way to show balance is to create, you know, in this case, the, a third character that was sort of omniscient, like the ghost of Huey, to speak. Uh, the thoughts of Charlie, so then it began a balanced story. It was, you heard the dialogue of Erie, but it was balanced by the inner dialogue of Charlie. And I really, and ultimately, I really saw that play as, you know, how can these people who don't have, can't connect, finally connect, and it's, I think it's kind of beautiful, they connect over, you know, throwing some dice at the end. Uh, you know, that, that's the way they, they find a connection. Um, so, anyway, this brings us demonstration, stage directions. <laughs> This is an excerpt from Huey. Erie Smith enters and approaches the desk. He is about the same age as the clerk, who has the same pasty, perspiry, nightlife complexion. There, the resemblance ends. Erie is about medium height, but appears shorter because he is stout, and his fat legs are too short for his body. <laughs> so are his fat arms. His big head squats on a neck, which seems part of his beefy shoulders. His face is brown, his stub nose flattened at the tip. His blue eyes have drooping lids and puffy pouches on them. His sandy hair is falling out, and the top of his head is bald. <laughs> he walks to the desk with a breezy, familiar air, his gait a bit waddling because of his short legs. He carries a Panama hat and mops his face with a red and blue silk handkerchief. He wears a light gray suit cut in the extreme. Tight waisted, Broadway boat, the coat open to reveal an old and faded but expensive silk shirt in the shade of blue that sets teeth 
Trousers are held up by a braided brown leather belt with a brass buckle. His shoes are tan and white. His socks are white silk. In manner, he is consciously a Broadway sport and a wise guy, the type of small fry gambler and horse player living hand to mouth on the fringe of the rackets, investing corners, doorways, cheap restaurants, the bars of minor speakeasies. He and his kind imagine they are in the real know, cynical oracles of the one true grapevine. His face is set <laughs> in the prescribed pattern of gambler's deadpan. His small, pursy mouth is always crooked in the cynical leer of one who possesses superior inside information, and his shifty, <laughs> once-over glances never miss the price tags he detects on everything and everybody. Yet there is something funny about his characterization of himself, some sentimental softness behind it, which doesn't belong in the hard-boiled <laughs> Plays that he won't take a chance on, 
and my kind of goal is to expand it to 25 or 30 because I see how at least that many could be done. And as I grow, I actually find avenues into some of the other ones. Um, so actually, if you ever think of an opportunity where we can do an O'Neill play, or, or you're doing an O'Neill play, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm totally game. Uh, I, and actually, doing this presentation, I'm totally game. Uh, you know, I, I, I also do Irish wakes and children's <laughs> birthday parties. <laughs> nothing like my balloon animal morning becomes Electra. Um, <laughs> But the other thing, is, my last note is, is a little bit more serious to know, which is um, uh, a few months ago, I uh, got an email out of the blue, um, personally did not, and the, the, the email started by saying, I recently watched your film, uh, Beyond, uh, Beyond the Horizon, and I think you did a really good job. And then he followed up with something, a real personal turn. He said, recently, my wife and I lost our baby daughter. And he went on to say, I've been, contrary to what you might think, I've been voraciously consuming O'Neill. Um, I find that he has great empathy and understanding for human pain, and there's a vitality to his work. It was, it's really meaningful to him. And I, and I would say, I, I agree. And I'm glad, because it was out of that email, I kind of said, yes, vitality is one of the words. It's a vitality to his work. Um, and so I would just, I would, I would end by just saying, um, I think, uh, Eugene O'Neill's message to us is not a happy one, but I think it is a comforting one. I think it is, life is difficult, there is a lot of pain, but you are not alone. Thank you.